eternal Father. For the sake of the death and resurrection of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, And he said again, once I was thinking of my fathership and a beer. These are the two most dangerous predators. Did David run away? He stood and what? Fought the sheep. I mean fought the bear and killed it. Amen. It's the same thing, no? Is there any difference? Yes. This one is better? Yes. Okay. So, if David stood and fought for his sheep, the same way Jesus, that means David laid down his life because in the process of fighting the lion, he could have died. Abby? Yes. Eh? Yes. So, David stood and fought the lion and the bear. And David fed his sheep. So, what is the difference between David and Jesus. David would have died. So you can even say maybe David was stronger than Jesus. What killed Jesus did not kill David. This full anise, have you seen them? Yes. Eh? Yes. Hmm. A story is told of um, um, a clash between full anise and um, some farmers and all of that. You know, they would have killed themselves, but they separated them and all of that. So when they now called them for reconciliation and peace, and they were told to narrate what happened. You know, the full and they said, when is that talking about the things that happened, about how he was injured, shot by the farmer and all that, he was okay. But when he now got to his car, he said, then they now killed five of my cow. When he was now narrating the death of his cow, he started crying. Do you understand that? That means everything they did to him did not pain him as much as what they did to his cow. Is he a good shepherd? Yes. Eh? Yes. Does he provide for his cattle? Yes. When you threaten his cattle, does he not come after you? So what now makes him different from Jesus? What makes Jesus the good shepherd? Stay without question. Stay without question. The answer is there. The answer is there. But we have to isolate what exactly makes Jesus the good shepherd and not a good shepherd like David or a good shepherd like the Flannies or a good shepherd like... Uh, there are priests who have died for their parishioners. Have you heard of St. Maximilian Kolbe? He sacrificed himself too. So what makes Jesus the good shepherd? Huh? He knows his sheep, his sheep know him. Every fluently person here knows they know their cow by different names. And their cow do what? Sometimes you can see three different fluently people coming with their cows. Abby? All of them will come and mix. Then when they want to go, they will make a particular sound. And each cow will follow the owner. So what made Jesus the good shepherd? Huh? He died. Many pastoralists have died for their animals. <clears throat> okay. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Calm down. <laughs> don't worry. Now, there are three things that define the relationship between the sheep and the shepherd. Three. I wanted to start from the least to the greater, but I think I want to start from the greatest. Three of them are ownership, responsibility, and interest. Everybody say ownership. ownership. 
Say responsibility. And what? And what? And what? Ownership, responsibility, and what? Say it again. Ownership, responsibility, and interest. Okay? All of that, ownership, responsibility, interest, are part of what makes the shepherd the good shepherd. But interest, interest is what separates Jesus as the good shepherd from other good shepherds. Interest. interest. Everybody say interest. interest. There is a difference between somebody is interested in you and somebody has your interest at heart. There is a difference between someone who is interested in you and someone who has your interest at heart. Hello? Come. Auntie, come, come, come. I they call you, they look back. Come. Valent, um, Sava, come. Didi, Bia. Yes, sir, come. Stay, stay here. No, stay down. No climb water. You know, be father. Okay, let's. This is her father. Eh? And this is her boyfriend. He loves her. He also says he loves her. And maybe he loves her truly. Eh? Okay. Which of the two is interested in her? And which of the two has her interest at heart? The father what? The father. Eh? The father is interested in her? The father does what? Has an interest at heart. This one does what? Is interested in her. What's the difference? Praise God. Are you getting there? Which one loves her most? Why? Because he has her interest at heart. He loves her. Eh? He's interested in her. Why is he interested in her? Because from her, he will get companionship. Abby? From her, he will get sex. Abby? Does he get sex from her? Eh? From her, he will make a family. Have his children. Is he going to make a family from her? Eh? So his love for her is almost unconditional. He is interested in her because some of his interests, the things that we profit him, will come from her. He is interested in her because, number one, she is his daughter. Ownership. And he has a sense of what? Responsibility towards her. That's why he took care of her. When he was paying for her school fees, did they sit down to write agreement that when you grow up, all these school fees are paid for you, you will pay me back. Did they have that agreement? Or is there any parent here who has such agreement with the, with the children? He did all that because she is his daughter. Ownership first. So every good shepherd has a sense of what? Ownership. Everybody say ownership. ownership. Say ownership. ownership. I want to hear you say ownership. ownership. There is a difference between an owner and somebody who is hired. That's what Jesus said. It's not like those who will run from the sheep. They are not bad shepherds actually. It's just that the sheep do not belong to them. There's a difference between how you will use your thing and how another person will use it. When you see people who are driving cars that are not their own, you will know. Eh? Then they are driving fine small cars like this where there is portal. 
in their eyes, that car will turn to armor tank. They will not just put to. They will just be cruising and enter and enter. Boom, boom, because it's not their own. But when you see the owner driving it, you see the way the owner will drive it. Small, small. Abby, it's like perfume. When you have your own perfume, now you buy them. When you want to spray, how do you spray? Shh. 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 But when somebody will be a combo down from you, maybe say your friend. And hell, when I get the juice. Shh. Like say that mosquito in one kill, Abby. Because it is not his own or her own. So normally, normally, people take care of what is theirs. People tend to take care of what is there more than any other person. Praise God. Praise God. Oh. I don't want to sweat this morning because people already made me sweat. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Yes. Eh? People tend to take care of what is theirs. More than every other person. You see this sermon, the three of us go preach them today. So now you're on Augusta. Come out your hand for your pocket. Love our boy. So first, let you should go home with. You, God owns you. When you understand the concept of ownership, spiritually, you will end transactional Christianity, which I have been preaching against. She didn't have to be the most beautiful girl for him to love and provide for her. Two of us. True. She didn't have to be the most intelligent girl. There may be other girls more beautiful than her, but the father cannot carry his love for her and give it to another girl because she's more beautiful. Because Nkabu, Nkain, it's my own. Now one name, Koba Akaba, and Namune. Praise God. That is the same way you belong to God. Psalm 100 says, We are His people, the sheep of His flock. We are His people, the sheep of God. The second reading, 1 John chapter 3. He says, Beloved. He said, Think of. He said, He said, Carry it, sit down, put your hand on your cheek. Say, think about the love that the Father has lavished upon us by letting us be called his children. And say that is what we are. We are his children. When you understand that, many of your anxieties will cease. You will stop doing some of the crazy, stupid things you do. Isaiah 43, fear not, O Israel, for I have redeemed you, O Jacob. For I have called by your name, you are mine. It is because you are mine. He said, then when you walk through the waters, I will be with you. He said, the storm shall not swallow you. You pass through fire, it shall not what? Burn you, for I have redeemed you. You are mine. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. God calls you in Kem. Mine. He calls you in Kem. In Zechariah, I think he says, You are the apple of my eyes. Anyone who touches you, touches me. And yet, you see many Christians behaving like. Christians are like Nigerians. You don't know the concept of ownership. Somebody philosophized and said, in a country, there are two kinds of people. There are citizens and there are idiots. There are citizens and there are what? Idiots. Who are the idiots? Idiots are those who do not see the country as their own. They look at the country from the prism of tribe, religion, ethnicity, they don't care whether the country is burning down or not. If there is somebody who is qualified for a job that will benefit every other person, instead of them putting that person, they will go and bring one mumu from their tribe and put there, forgetting that everybody will suffer. They don't care how the country is run. When there is a debate on the economy, 
they would rather leave that debate on economy and be watching a deliverance session on television. Why? Because they are idiots. And the biggest idiots in Nigeria are our politicians. Because they are the ones who are using tribalism, uh, nepotism, religious um, jingoism and all of that to scatter the country. So they are the biggest idiots. But citizens see the country as their own. They own it. And they do everything possible to do what? To take care of their country. Those are citizens. Nigerian politicians don't see Nigeria as their own, contrary to what people expect. No. They see Nigeria as an opportunity to exploit. Praise God, though. Hallelujah. Praise God, though. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Don't be like that. You belong to God. I have carved your name at the palm of my hands. That's what he's saying in Isaiah 49. So at what point, at what point does God abandon you? That you have to, you see, I, as uh, Abed, I mean, as I see some Christians say, I am going to seek the face of God. And seeking the face of God means you are going somewhere. So, somebody who is your father is now lost. Abby? No, he's lost now. <laughs> That's why you are going to seek. Why, what, why are you seeking for something? It's not something that is lost. Eh? So how can someone who owns you hold you at the palm of his hand all of a sudden you cannot see his face again? Then you have to go somewhere to seek his face. What does that tell you? Is it that you don't know who you are? Or you don't know the person that owns you? Praise God. Oh. Praise God. Oh. When he started taking care of her, did she write a letter of appeal begging him to take care of her, give her food when she's hungry, pay her school fees, put a um, shelter over her? Did she write a letter of appeal? Did she go to meet another person and say, I bet come and tell this man we bomb meal, making the pay my school fees, making it. Did she go to meet another person? Eh? Did she do anything? He started loving her even before she became conscious why you they go pay money to see the face of god your father let me ask your neighbor why hey, just touch your neighbor say why neighbor why neighbor why <coughs> touch your neighbor say why neighbor why neighbor why <laughs> are you a stranger that person you are going to consult to consult god for you i thought both of you are children of god or he's the child of God, you are a stranger or a slave. You see, many of you are not operating with the spirit of sonship. Romans chapter 8. He said, What you have received is not the spirit of slavery. What you have received is the spirit of what? Adoption. Many Christians are slaves. He said, The slave in John, I said, The slave has no permanent place in the house, only the son has. Many of you have no permanency in God. That's why you are consulting this person, you are consulting that person, you are doing this or doing that, you are seeking the face of God, you are looking for God's favor here and there. Your own father, you will live where he is to go to meet another person, to help you bring the face of your own father. You are a slave. The spirit of slavery is on many of you Christians. Those of you with solution mentality, all of you are slaves. Because if you understand who your father is, you will do what? You will relax. Can I hear you, man? Yeah. Can I hear you, man? Yeah. Ownership. During the last regime, Buhari's regime, when banditry was at its peak, they were cut, kidnapping Nigeria and Sopan and Abi. They were even killing some. Did you remember that there was a time they kidnapped some Americans? <laughs> what happened? Under how many days? America came from their country with their soldiers, entered this country, released their own citizens. Ownership. Praise God. Praise God. 
So the quality of a thing will also depend on ownership. So I'm telling you one thing today is have a sense of ownership. It's a seed the love the Father has lavished on, but let us be called God. I am a child of God. Wow. I am a child of God. If you are a parent here, think about what you did for your children. Did they merit it? Did they beg you? Child, helpless children, children that will pull on you, urinate on you. They don't do anything in the house when you still love them, sacrifice your sleep, your money, everything for them. That is exactly how God treats you. How can't you get this? Say you are mine. Okay. I wish there is a name called Inkechuku. For those of you who are coming, when you are going to give birth to your when you give birth, all the young uh, boys and girls coming up, those of you from Mibu. Inkechuku means God's own. Just like husband and wife who call themselves. Okay. Please, when you born a child, name your child Inkechuku. Because that's what God calls each of us here. Yeah. He said, I have called you by your name. You are mine. What is mine in Igbo? Okay. In Hausa, Nawa. Yes, I have a, we have a parishioner Metama. His name is Charles Naala. Is it Charles Naala or Charles Ala? Uh, Zimuta, tell your children when they're born children in the future. Eh? They should name the child Na. Allah, Kona Jesus. That's the meaning of what? Nkem, Nkechuku. Behave like Nkechuku. Hallelujah. Then, take response. Sorry. Take ownership of your life too. Nobody owns your life but you. Nobody owns your salvation but you. Nobody owns your health but you. Nobody owns your family but you. Take ownership. Let me tell somebody take ownership. Take ownership. Take ownership, take ownership. Own your children, own your health, own your happiness. I think I've told you before, nobody can make you happy. And so nobody should make you sad. Somebody who cannot make you happy should not make you sad. That's the fa- battle I fought this morning now. Sure, I gave money to a person who is supposed to buy fuel. Since last week, oh, he didn't buy fuel. We started mass and um, generator went off and the devil came and said to me i think i told you you will die in this place i said to hell with you i will not die i will use other there is another word microphone he said don't go and preach you waste of that i go preach somebody who does not make you happy should not make you sad only i heard me tell your neighbor own your happiness own your happiness touch your neighbor say own your happiness own your happiness praise god own your happiness. Own your health. It is not doctors and nurses that own it. It is you. Own your health. Own your faith. Own your faith. We'll be that one. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Own your health. Take care of your health. Own it. It is yours. Back to them. Are you guys tired? Valentine, why are you sweating? <laughs> he's sweating because his wife is here. After his wife is going to ask him questions. <laughs> your wife is here having a, a girlfriend in the church far. <laughs> Praise God. You see what ownership? But ownership is not even enough. Because there are some people who own something and are still careless about them. They are still reckless about them. So with ownership comes responsibility. Everybody say responsibility. He has a sense of responsibility towards her. That's why he had to do those things he did for her. He feels a sense of responsibility towards her. That's what parenting should be. So ownership is not enough. Because there are some people who do not take care of what they own. That's why I see some children... Parents who are irresponsible, look at their children. Every time your children are running up and down with ringworms everywhere. The map of Africa, Asia, uh, America, uh, where? 
all of them are in the head of your children. Cut by ringworm. What causes ringworm? Is it not death? You will not bath them. Sand will fill their head. They will sleep with it, wake up with it. If you want to bath them, blah, 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 carelessly, you don't bath, you don't come out. They are wearing tatar clothes all the time. They look unkept. But you see other children, you are not the only one who is poor. This one has nothing to do with poverty. This one is his responsibility. You see other children, their parents are taking care of They bath them very well. The poor clothes they are wearing is what? It's neat and tidy. You see such so children, you want to carry them. But when somebody sees your own children, the person will be praying, blood of Jesus, help me first, before I can even go near. It's ownership and responsibility. Take responsibility for what God has given you, for what you own. Same thing, some people are irresponsible about their health. You don't watch what you eat when you eat. You don't watch what you do. You don't know that your biggest health defini uh, definer or factor is what you eat. Environment-wise, no. Many of you would not mind. When that sickness comes now, you'll be looking for 150,000. 50,000 to go and run tests and do treatments. But less than that 50,000 can put nets in your house to avoid mosquito. Especially when you're living in an environment that is polluted. You live in an environment where gutters are not closed and your windows have no net. Your door has no net. That 20,000 or 10,000 you used to put down there that's looking big for you. When malaria hits all your children, you will spend more than 70,000. And they say prevention is what? Better than. It's about responsibility. Can I hear you, amen? Can I hear you, amen? No. Help me tell someone, take responsibility, take responsibility. Tell somebody, take responsibility. Take responsibility for your life, for your family, for your health, for your happiness, everything. It's the same thing. And I even define respons responsibility as two words. Response and ability. So I call it responsibility. Your ability to respond. So what it means is that don't go and carry things that are above you. When your capacity is not enough, you cannot respond. So don't go and carry what is above you. I'll bring you to childbirth again. I talked about it the other Sunday. If you have 50,000 capacity, give birth to children at 50,000 that I can do what? Take care of. That's responsibility. You can't have only 50,000 and you already have two, three wives. 15 children. You want to respond. But there is no ability. That's why some people rest no more civility because ability no day. You want to respond to education, no ability. You spot out what? Response, no ability. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Oh. Hallelujah. And finally, it's interest. Like I've said, the person who is interested in you does not necessarily have your interest at heart. And that is where the good shepherd, Jesus, is different from the rest of us, including me. The full and guy takes care of his sheep and his cattle because from there he's also eating. So he is interested in the sheep because his interest also lies in taking care of the sheep. If he does not take care of the cow which he sells to make money, will he be alive? Eh? So he is interested in the cows, in his cattle, because his interest also lies there. And there is nothing wrong with that. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that. If we will not pray by that as human beings, we will not even have problems. Our leaders should be interested in us because their interest is in what? In us. They make the country good. More money is produced. For those of them who want to steal, they have sense. They should make the country good. There will be more money so they can even steal more. And we will not be complaining. If there is constant light, good roads, 
job opportunity. People are working. Do you think we will care whether they are stealing billions or not? Do, will we care? No. We wouldn't care. So if you have 100 million naira, instead of stealing 99 million, why don't you provide jobs and uh, roads with like 80 million, still 20 million, Abby? From the jobs you have provided, more people are working, more tasks will come. Now, when they are working, they are earning and they are living. They will not be interested in you. And from the tasks they will pay, you cannot go ahead and steal as much as. I'm telling you, we will not care. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's not everybody who is interested in you that has your interest at heart. So, Jesus as the good shepherd, he is not interested in the sheep because his interest lies in the sheep. No. He is completely interested in the sheep for the interest of the sheep. That's why he is the good shepherd. <laughs> Me am interested in you as your priest. Because... As a Catholic priest, I don't have any other place I work in. Now. Abby? Eh? Praise God. Do you? Hallelujah. If I don't do mass, I'll go do a battery. Eh? Answer me. If I don't do a battery, I'll go chop. Eh? If I don't chop, what's going to happen to me? I'll go disappear. So, there is a level of I'm interested in you because my interest is also with you people. Uh -huh. So, you bring goods and yam. It's for my interest. I go chop them. No, what I'm only. Abby? Yeah. And all the Thanksgiving you do here, it's for my interest now. Abby, I don't go chop. Uh, you give me goods, you give me money, all that things. Then, me, I will give you the word of God, give you the spiritual things you need. So both of us are interested in each other because we have not just our own interests at heart, but our own interests, what will benefit us, also comes from each of us being interested. It is called mutuality. Symbiotic mutuality or symbiotic relationship. Abby, uh, symbiotic. The Fulani and his cow have symbiotic relationship. And every other human this thing and like i said there is nothing wrong in it you they say this hand wash this hand abby you take care of me the way you can i take care of you the way i can no wahala isn't it uh -huh. so that's the difference between me and jesus he we have there is no personal interest in loving us in saving us he just did because he loves us unconditionally oh now she just because he owns us we are not the only thing he owns. That's why the Bible says, when I look at the stars, I look at the moon, I look at the sun, I look at everything you have made. And I'm now wondering, what is man that you care for him? If you divide the properties that God owns into ten, human beings, you are not even up to point one. Meaning that he can lose us and he will not lose anything. Do well, you understand me? Praise God. Are you following me? So he has no interest in being interested in you. And yet he is still interested in you. You see, that's why transactional gospel is idolatry. It's from the pit of hell. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are you expecting me to die for you? No. Eh? No. Or not expect me now to die for now? No. Who say yes? <laughs> if I blow you, eh? <laughs> me die for you. What, what will my death do for you? So if I die for you now, you will go to heaven. <laughs> my dear sister, when danger comes, all of us will look for safety. I will not leave you alone, but I make sure all of us look for what? For safety. We must be interested in each other and look after each other's interests. It's only God that loves 
unconditional. The next set of people that love unconditionally are parents to their children. But there are also their interests. They don't want to mention that yet. So that's what made Jesus the good shepherd. So the good shepherd is the one who is interested in you so much so that when your interest and his own interest clashes, he will sacrifice his own interest for the sake of your own interest. Can he do that for her? Can he sacrifice his own interest for her? But is it possible for him to sacrifice his own interest for her? He already did. That's why she grew. Do you understand that? Clearly. That's why Jesus is what? I say, I do this not by compulsion. Nobody is compelling me. I lay down my life. It is in my power to lay it down. So also it's also in my power to do what? Take it up again. Praise God. I think I've talked enough for today. She's not your daughter. Oh, now illustration, sir. Thank you. Especially, she's not your girlfriend. Now your wife will even deal with you. Please go and sit down. God bless you. So that's what makes Jesus the ultimate good shepherd. What we can do is we should try to learn to be like him. There are times in life where you may have to sacrifice your own interest for the good of others. There are times. It's not always, but there are times you should have to do that. When that time comes, you did. Philippians chapter 2. He said nobody should do anything for his own selfish interest. But think about the interest of others. Hallelujah. And sometimes because as a human being, like I said, we are not Jesus. Jesus did that. He was not looking for a reward from any human being. No, no, no. Nothing like that. But the things you do for others, God has a way of doing what? Of bringing them back to bless you. I read something on the internet. I don't know whether it's true. Whether it's true or not, but it's a good illustration. J.J. Okocha. How many of you know him? J.J. Okocha. How many of you know him? Footballer, right? And there's a story about him on the internet. Like I said, I don't know whether it's true or not, but even if it's not true, it makes for a good moral lesson. He said, before he became a professional footballer, they sent scouts. Scouts are those who come and pick good players, then take them um, to bigger clubs and all that. So they had a match. And the scouts said to them, in his own team, I mean, they said to them, the two teams who were playing the match, they said, the people who we select are those who will score the highest goals. Those are the ones we select. And in JJ's club, him and one other person, another player, they have scored two, two goals. All right? They have scored two, two goals. Yes. And um, <clears throat> towards the end of the match, this other guy, who has scored two goals like JJ, had the opportunity to score an open net. But he saw JJ at the other side. So instead of scoring, he passed it to JJ, and JJ scored. Then JJ had three, he had two. At the end, they took JJ. And you now know the story. He went and became a professional footballer and all of that. Then the person who was interviewing the guy who told him, so he said, why did you do it? Why didn't you score and go yourself? Or, oh, yeah, that JJ even asked him later, why did you do that? And he said to him, you and I know that you, JJ, you are a better footballer than myself. If he scored this goal now, they will carry me, but I will not last long. I may not even go and succeed. But everybody knows you are better than me. So I better give that opportunity to you, knowing that you will go further than myself. Wow. He sacrificed his interest for another. But the guy who was interviewing this guy now, now looked at his comment and saw BB Cass. Because after that match, he didn't play football again. He went and started, uh, he was, was even doing small, small thing. His career ended there as a footballer. But the guy saw his big house, saw big cars up and down, and said, Why are you, How are you able? to afford this kind of big life. You did not play professional 
football, but you are living like professional footballers. And the guy laughed and said, Okocha is the reason. <laughs> Hallelujah. When he was doing that, he never had in his mind that one day Okocha would do all that for him. And he's also lucky, if this is a true story, he's also lucky to have an Okocha who is a grateful person. Let me warn you now. Don't think it's everybody you do good that will come back and return the good to you. What makes you a good person is that you are doing good to somebody not with the expectation that one day the person will come and reward you. You are doing good to that person because you know this good is good for the person. That's what makes you a good person. It's not seed sowing. That's why I give me, I give you. It's, not, it's a wrong theology in the church. Those are people who tell you to buy God's blessing with money. They are confusing you. You don't give to God so you can get. You give to God because you have. And he's the source of all you have. Don't be doing good with the expectation of it coming. In fact, if you are doing good to somebody and you're expecting that someday the person will give you back, you are not praying well for yourself. What you are saying is that you will remain in this stagnant position. This person will be rising. Why can't you rise? That's what I pray to God for. All those I'm helping. I don't want to be in a condition tomorrow where they will help me. I want to keep growing. As I'm helping them, I am growing. I'm not expecting them to be the one that will come and do what? Help me tomorrow. In any case, the primary reason you do the good is because they need it. That's what made Jesus the good shepherd. It's not everybody who is interested in you that has your interest at heart. For we as Christians to have the interest of people at heart. Don't be interested in anybody if you don't have the person's interest at heart. Are you hearing me? Or are they hear me? Or are they hear me? And don't be carried away when somebody or some people are interested in you. Be very careful. They might be interested in you because of what is in need for them. And all of that. But like I said, we are told to be like Jesus. Try to have the interest of people at your heart. And I'm here to tell you today, God has your interest at heart. He's not doing it for you so that he can get something from you. He's not asking you to do something before he loves you. He already loves you even before you became conscious. So we pray that all of us will continue to benefit from the goodness of the Good Shepherd, through Christ our Lord. Amen. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, he For the sake of his sorrowful passion